What's interesting about diving, and for me in this context, diving really is a metaphor. It's a metaphor for an environment that is unforgiving and where you have a technological requirement for decisions to be made appropriately in combination with an error-prone, fallible, distractible, incorrigible biological process. That's me, incorrigible, biological, fallible process. Here's dive gear. I mean, you've seen our, our interface, our human IT interface today has been flawless, hasn't it? It's been fantastic, we all love it. This is, this is in a forgiving environment. Now let's think about an unforgiving environment. So when we go from common space, which is us, a bunch of hairless monkeys, anybody know where this is by any chance? Gibraltar, Gibraltar. very good. Um, and we go to inner space or outer space, our physiology is impacted, and we are put into an environment that is hostile to us, an environment that is unforgiving. So I, I love the, uh, if you saw uh, Dan Orr's talk last night, that astronaut that's coming out of the uh, this, this spaceship, and the door closes behind him. I don't know if you guys have ever seen that little, little video clip. And he's, he sees the, uh, the door close, and he's like, oh, where's my key? You know, he's doing the whole Columbo thing. <laughs> That's an unforgiving environment. You can't just you know, call AAA and hope that a new rocket ship's gonna come meet you on the moon. You actually have to have everything work. So a couple of objectives. Just wanna talk about some of the annual statistics uh, about diving accidents and why divers end up dying. This is really part and parcel with everything that Dr. Sadler just talked about. So just to give you sort of a ballpark, these, some of these statistics are a little bit fudgy because we don't have a great sense of our denominator but there's probably the better part of about two and a half million divers out there in the North American world. We have millions of dives annually. We have, as far as we know, about a thousand diving accidents in North America annually. That's what, we get, what gets reported. And if you listen to Dan Orr talk about this last night, no one's obligated to call us. And just so you guys know this, if you're involved with the Divers Alert Network, no one is obligated to call us. And if you haven't called us, if you're involved with something or one of your patients is involved, it's very likely that we haven't been called. So please know that I do not have clairvoyance. We do not have a bat phone. We actually need to be interfaced with just like you do. Any more than you know that a patient of yours comes into the emergency room until someone calls you. Just saying. All right. About 85 fatalities annually. That is an average that has been consistent for about the last three decades. So why are we talking about diving fatalities? How many of you die of, or not you, obviously you're alive, but how many people in this country die every year of influenza? It's about 30 to 50,000 a year. Dan, or what's your statistic about toasters? 850. 850 a year. Those bloody toasters, they're out to get us. We should, <laughs> we should go to the uh, U.S. Regulatory Agency of Toaster Manufacturers and really raise cane. <laughs> so decompression sickness is something we talk about a lot in this, this conference. So I've, some of you have seen this already, but it kind of gives you a little bit of context. This is not diving fatalities, but this is how we interface with our environment. It's a physiological stress. Overall, taking all divers that we collect data on, it's about two to four cases per 10,000 dives. Uh, that, is, that is the overall statistic. In warm water liveaboards and on resorts, it's somewhere around zero to two cases per 10,000 dives. And in the heroes at Scapa Flow, who knows where Scapa Flow is? Geology majors, outstanding. It's the northern coast of Scotland. They're very proud of this. The guys in the north coast of New Jersey, very proud because they have very similar statistics. Very interesting types of diving, very different types of diving. These guys are usually deep technical colder water divers. So let's look at some fatality stats. In the 1970s, we had the way the data was collected was about 150 fatalities a year. As I just said before, we've had an average of about 85 a year. One of the biggest problems is that we don't have a great denominator. If I say to you, right, we've got 85 deaths a year, you go, well, is that out of 90 people a year who were diving? That would change your perception, wouldn't it? If it's 85 out of two and a half million, doesn't quite seem so big. 
So it's important to understand our denominator. And so how has Divers Alert Network tried to figure this out? What we do know is who's insured and who is a member. So if we take the fatalities amongst that group, it's not everybody, but it's at least a catchment of a group that we might be able to extrapolate out. And the best that we can come up with is about 16 per 100,000 insured members. I know I realize that's not a statistic that just rolls off the tongue and you really kind of gives you a sense of intuition, but there you go. Interestingly enough, this data is very consistent with BSAC, or British Subaqua Club. Now, when I grow up, I want to be a Brit, and I want to wear a tie, and I want to call things a Subaqua Club. They must have tea and crumpets in the afternoon because it's very, very uh, robust. And I, we're just, you know, most of us Americans are heathen pirates who just sort of hang out and go, arr, and, you know, eat fried food all day long and pack more cholesterol into our arteries. <laughs> so. We had a, sorry, I digress. We had a fatality con conference in 2010, and uh, we looked at a lot of the data surrounding fatalities, and we tried to come up with a couple of take-home points. One that I think is very important is that physical fitness and underlying cardiac disease influence fatality rates. For whom is this a revelation? Sometimes science actually has to quantify the obvious for us to believe it, and I think this is actually an important role of science. Anybody tell me about what the fatality rate annually on a percentage basis for heart disease in this country is? How many percent of us are going to die from heart-related disease? It's ballpark around 30% of us. So we know walking into this room, I've got a 30% chance at some point in my life of dying from heart disease. That's why guys like Dick Sadler have a job. That's why they, they do it really well, and that's why it's really important. But if this was 0.0003%, you wouldn't have cardiothoracic surgery. It wouldn't be work to get done. Age, and I think Dr. Strauss did a very nice job talking about this, is one indicator of underlying disease and morbidity over time, but it is only one indicator. So we all know that heart-related disease goes up with time. Our decision-making processes also seem to improve with time. It's the one thing that we can sort of count on, that we sort of get better at reasoning. But age itself is not a causative factor. It's just one of a possibility of factors. So what do we think causes diving fatalities? So here's a great graph. This tells you a little bit. We know that about 70% of these cases are put into this huge bucket of drowning. Now, it's very easy to beat up on our pathologists and say, these jack wagons have no idea what they're talking about. We're a bunch of divers. We really understand what's going on, and these guys just say, right, if you're wet and dead, you must, be, must have drowned, and therefore it's done. Now, on one level, that's not, a, not an unfair statement. On the other, they also have a legal obligation. They have to actually come down with a diagnosis. Why? Because they can't be, well, it could be seven different things, and based upon the, the phase of the moon and Saturn in the seventh house, it could have been seven other things. They can't know that. They can't sit around and guess. So unless they've got a better way of coming up with information, it's probably a drowning. I like these two statistics. So this is not age as in your chronology. That's arterial gas embolism. And that's cardiac-related disease. Then there's decompression sickness, hardly a, an issue at all. And then there's shark attack or trauma. That's a joke. It's not, very, not a whole lot of humor here. I appreciate chuckles. It makes me feel good. So really, we have a big bunch of stuff in drowning. So this is bad things happened in the water column, and this demonstrates that the water column is an unforgiving environment. If you become incapacitated there, you're likely to drown. If you become incapacitated here, you're likely to just become incapacitated. You're not going to drown. So it has serious consequences. So let's look at some of the underlying issues that probably led to that drowning. So we've got triggers. This is the thing that starts the ball rolling down the hill. So 41% insufficient gas. Situation awareness, none of us desire to run out of gas. How many of you run out of gas every day in your car? You don't. You look at your gas gauge and you go to the gas station frequently enough. So no one jumps in the water with the intention of doing this. No one jumps in the water with the intention of getting entrapped. What a horrible way to go. No one goes into a cave and says, you know what, I'm just going to get caught in that cave today. Yeah, I'm going to show the world. No, that's not what happens unless you're suicidal. You get caught because of some bad thing that happened. You get lost. You, it's silt out. You don't find your way out. Equipment problems. 
I think Dan Orr has a wonderful way of talking about equipment problems, which is usually the human interface with equipment. So we've had equipment problems here, but there's, there's no bad consequence other than delaying things a little bit. If you have equipment problems underwater, this is serious business. If I have equipment problems, let's say my, what I'm wearing is my equipment problems, am I going to die if my belt falls off or my shoes fall off or I take my jacket off? No. But if my belt is a weight belt and all of a sudden I can't remove it or my fins aren't working or my mask is leaking and I'm distracted or my regulator's broken or I don't know how to use it, all of a sudden my interface with this equipment really has extreme importance. So these things lead to disabling injuries, asphyxia, this is of course not breathing anymore, arterial gas embolism, usually associated with insufficient gas and a rapid ascent. Almost all of those are human factor issues. The only number one primary underlying health-related issue is cardiac disease. So when we think about medical fitness to dive issues, what actually kills people? This is an important place for us to focus our energies. Cardiac disease from a medical perspective is important, but what about all the rest of these? Is there a place for us as physicians, as people who are taking care of divers, to interface a little bit more on some of these other human factors? So moving forward, I just want to plant a seed because I think our field can evolve a little bit. And for those of you who have never seen a diver, wouldn't know what one looked like if you ran into one. This is an area for us to evolve our thinking, not just from a situational awareness place in the moment, but also how do we intervene in our clinics? And is there a role for, uh, for medicine to actually interface with training? So it's not just enough to say, right, do you have cardiovascular fitness enough to do the kinds of diving that you're doing? But I would love it if physicians started asking the question, so when was the last time you got in the water? When was the last time you rehearsed or practiced any of your skills? Have you retaken a class? Have you engaged in some of that, that kind of activity? Because those are the questions that actually will probably save lives, far more than are you on to Norman versus Lisinopril. That is not where the rubber hits the road. Those are important questions, and that's oftentimes where our medical training takes us. But if we actually want to impact diving fatality, a far more important and probably a far more impactful question is, when was the last time you got in the water? When was the last time you got any training? When was the last time you refreshed any of your skills? I know it's kind of limp and sort of seems sort of soft and kind of not very medical, but it's probably more impactful. So I think an active involvement and an active championing of people's involvement in their skill maintenance and development is an important role for us. The other part of it is informed consent. We talk a lot about whether or not a given medical condition is commensurate with safe diving. As though that information lives in some sort of hollowed ball of space and all of a sudden I'm going to know that yes, you can dive if you have such and such. The truth is, this is all about risk. What we do if we get underwater is about risk. What we do if we're going to operate on somebody is risk. There's a risk reward involvement and there is the bridge is informed consent. People make that bridge themselves. I think it's okay. Let's just think about open heart surgery for just a moment because it's absolutely psychotic when one thinks about, right, I'm going to ask you to open up my chest, stop my heart, rip out some vessels somewhere, plug them back in, and start my heart again. And it's okay if I just, you know, lose fourth grade because I didn't really need it anyway and I wake up a little dumber. It's remarkable that we do that and we consider that a norm in our medical world. This is, hopefully you don't know disparagement. I just think it's amazing that anybody said, right, I've got an idea. I'm going to do that to somebody. And actually, people consent to doing this. Why do they consent to doing it? Because they think that the, the risk-reward ratio is in their favor. It's the same thing with diving. So if you can talk to somebody about their risks and rewards, talk to them about their behaviors and what actually triggers people to get into accidents, I think you make more informed patients out of the people you take care of. Very good. Last of my preaching. Quick question for you. Data on the triggers underlying diving fatalities have demonstrated that all of the following are associated with diving fatalities on a statistically significant basis. Running out of gas. Yeah. Equipment troubles or troubles with equipment. Yes. Shark attack. No. Good. And entrapment. Yes. Thank you very much for your attention.